Hello. Hi, John Michael. How are you? I'm doing very well. Yourself? Very well. It's very nice to speak with you. I've commented on your blog for, for years mm -hmm. now, and uh, so it's mm -hmm. nice to actually uh, have a one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah, and you know, and, and I, I I love podcasts. Yeah, um, they're free. They're basically free publicity for me, and it's always pleasant to have a chance to talk to to somebody about some about you know whatever ideas or interests or things like that. So I, I'm very glad to be on. I've been on some insane number of punk. You know, I have a bunch of questions, but uh, you know, hope, hope hopefully hopefully things will flow organically as well. So that'll be nice. They they normally do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just one of those things. I guess I'll give you a, a little introduction for my listeners who might not be familiar mm -hmm. with you. And John Michael Greer is a writer, very prolific uh, on a number of subjects, the occult being one of them, but also post-industrial decline, author of science fiction. Really, um, the way I have been exposed to a lot of your ideas is through your blogs, uh, formerly the Arch Druid Report, now uh, Echo Sophia. Um, really just... It, if you want to get a, an opinion or an idea that is not usually expressed in mainstream culture, uh, that's the place to go. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That's, that's, that's really high praise. Well, it's, it's hard, you know, and a lot of people say that that's what they're doing, but you, mm -hmm. you get a lot of the same old, you know, you get a lot of people trying to brand themselves as uh as as real renegades while they're just basically propping up the status quo in some way. Oh, yeah. The number of times I've had people, like, post something on my blog or have a conversation with some people, and they're coming up with what they insist are really exciting, radical ideas nobody has ever heard before, and they trot out some piece of conventional wisdom that's been absolutely old hat for 50 years. Yeah, yeah. It's just... I mean, the number of people who, who come who come up to me and insist that with with all kinds of you know the, all this sort of this is this really exciting new idea the technology will solve all our problems. Yeah, and I'm going. Oh, this is a new idea. This was this wasn't a new idea for H. G. Wells, and he's been dead for more than a century. <laughs> yeah, it's it's really quite fascinating, and I think the place you see that most is uh, is is Elon Musk. Y you know. <laughs> The 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 self driving car. I, I was uh -huh. I was looking into this. Um, you know, it's something that they had in the World's Fair in 1939. They were talking mm -hmm. about it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's... Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah, it's a, yeah, it's a, self driving cars and flying cars. Flying cars. To That's... my mind, the fl the flying car is the ultimate talisman of. A, a sort of what would you say a kind of technological fugue state where people are stuck in the same outdated technological fantasy the thing is there have been flying cars made i think the first was made in 1907 okay <laughs> and they don't the problem with flying cars is not that you can't build them you can there have been dozens hundreds maybe of flying cars the problem is that all the engineering things that make a car work well make an airplane work poorly. And all the engineering tweaks that make an airplane work well make a car work poorly. So a flying car is always going to be a bad car and a bad plane. Yeah. And it's going to cost so much because of the, all the you know, necessary de design nonsense that you could buy a good car, a good plane, and keep them both fueled for 10 years off the, uh, for the same price. <laughs> so why do we keep on getting these rehashes of 1907 futures? Yeah. It's a fascinating question, and it, I think it really, it, it really cuts deep in, into the roots of, of how we got ourselves into the problem that we're in now, as well as um, the roots of the, the basically superstitious worship of progress that fills most people's minds. We cough, cough, Elon Musk, cough, cough. <laughs> well, I, I heard one better today. I was listening. Oh, go ahead. Oh, well, I'm excited. Yeah, it, it was. I, I didn't actually read the piece. I was listening to the, the Chapo Trap House podcast. And mm -hmm. they they were skewering a recent piece in the Atlantic, who Good. which is supposed to be a respectable you know uh, publication, but and, and thus it is by definition rehashing <laughs> the absolutely the most useless ideas of the status quo. You know any respect if a publication is respectable, go to it for fun. You will laugh yourself <laughs> sick. Go ahead. Yeah, they were they were talking about a a plan somebody had had for 
fixing the New York City subway. And they started off with the, prop- with the proposition that the New York City subway is beyond repair, which I actually, to some degree, uh, agree with. Well, you know, that, that there's just going to be diminishing returns. And it's just, I mean, having not lived in New York for a while, my friends mm-hmm. who still live there tell me horror stories about how things are just slowly deteriorating and the service mm-hmm. is getting poorer and poorer. But mm-hmm. this, but this plan for fixing it really just put like ma- would have made Elon Musk blush. I think this. <laughs> okay, the, you, that's a heck of a buildup. Uh, I want to hear what the you have, the, the author decided that we should get rid of the subway system. We should remove mm-hmm. all the rails and put self-driving cars down in the subways oh, which 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 just <laughs> which just i i don't i don't know i i, I and, and you know they were obviously pointing out all the problems with this because it's a fairly savvy podcast i mean there's yeah even... exactly and, it, and it's a very stupid idea of course so yeah. yeah that must have been fun oh my goodness oh my goodness yeah. but yeah now the thing is it would be actually perfectly easy to fix the New York subways. It'd actually be perfectly easy to fix most of what's wrong with New York. All you have to do is evacuate the city for a year. <laughs> you see, if you just shut, it, just shut it down, move everyone away, and then you can send the crews in and actually fix things. The difficulty that we're facing, of course, is, well, there are two. On the one hand, trying to fix something like that while people are still using it is going to be a problem. On the other hand, um, it's going to cost so much more to fix you know, just because of costs increasing and everyone has their ideas of what could go in. There, there are actually effective ways that the New York, New York system could be repaired, but they'd all involve going back to simpler technologies rather than more complex ones. Mm. You could take – now, here's, here's one, one that I've been exploring for a while. Old-fashioned streetcars. Yeah. Okay? They're simple. They're cheap. You have a conductor and a driver on them rather than high-tech technology, so you're hiring people, so they're jobs, right? Okay, but it's a known technology. All the details are worked out. They could be hitting the streets in three months. They'd simply have to you know, put rails down the streets. This is not high-tech. It's easy to do. And since it's above the ground, you don't have to go through all the tunnel nonsense. You just have to string some wires and put in some rails and get a bunch of rolling stock. And you've got streetcars going up and down Manhattan and, and across Manhattan and everything. It, <clears throat> it works. Nobody will do it because it's an old technology. You know, we've, got to, we've got to progress. We've got to go onward and forward, even though going onward and forward produces, costs more, produces worse results, and, and very often just doesn't work. Now, once you... Um, once you've got the streetcars in place, of course, you've taken a lot of the pressure off. What do you, then you could t- maybe look at shutting down some of the tunnels completely for a mm. while and actually be able to rebuild if you wanted to. On the other hand, since New York City is going to be um, awash with um, tidewater yeah. in the not-too-distant future, and those, the, all those tunnels are going to fill with seawater. Um, with you know, as the as the ocean continues to rise, maybe we need to revisit this entirely and look at okay, maybe New York, maybe you know, we should evacuate New York and like not come back. <laughs> well, that's that's always been my my thought about the the damage caused by by going back a couple of years now ca- caused by Sandy is that by the time mm-hmm. they get by the time they get it fixed, the next storm or the next mm-hmm. sea level rise is just going to come through mm-hmm. and it's just going to be. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh-huh. Sisyphus rolling the boulder up the hill, you know. Got it in one. Yeah. Got it in one. Yeah. And yeah, and eventually, yeah, eventually, um, there, there was actually a real, I don't remember the name of the novel now, but Kim Stanley Robinson had this oh, yeah. a very well written novel uh, with New York, and here's the New York skyscrapers rising from the sea. He's usually a more careful writer than that. <laughs> um, do you have any idea what, first of all, what seawater does to structural steel? Yeah, I can imagine. Second. Yeah. Um, secondly, what would happen if you had, um, you know, winter storms flinging driftwood against these buildings Ooh, and so on? Yeah. yeah. Exactly. No. What's going to happen? Uh, what's going to happen over the next over the next century, probably, uh, given the rate the Greenland is breaking down at this point, um, is that New York is going to be abandoned. It's going to end up, you know, you will people will come to wherever the where the seashore is, and they will see these skeletal towers rising out of the ocean, 
And people are going to go out to them with rafts and tear the things down from metal because it's cheaper to get metal that way than it is to dig it out of the earth. And that's the future of New York. How, nobody wants to think. Nobody wants to think about that. But that's the that's where we're headed. I think this is one of the things that made me more open to some of the things you talk about. Um, mm-hmm. how, you know, I know you grew up in the Pacific Northwest, mm-hmm. um, but how, how many how many World's Fair sites have you have you been past? <laughs> well, obviously, I grew up with one. Yeah, um, yeah. The, the, uh, this, the 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 site of the Seattle World's Fair, later now the Seattle Center. Was in fact, I attended the Seattle World Fair, although I was not in a good my my um, I didn't really have a good view as I was still inside my mom. Yeah. Uh, but um, but yeah, so there was that one. There yeah. was the um, Spokane, Washington had an had an expo had a World's Fair in 1974, and I've been to that one. Um, other than that, I do not think I have been to one. So you mentioned the, the, the skyscrapers sticking up out of the water. When I grew mm-hmm. up, I grew up on, on Long Island and, mm-hmm. and driving through Long Island to get to Manhattan or wherever else we drive through Queens sometimes. And we, we mm-hmm. pass the old world's fair site and, uh, yes. and, and, and there are these observation decks, right? And they look kind of mm-hmm. like flying saucers or something. And as a kid, you know, I liked sci-fi and stuff and there was observation mm-hmm. decks and a few other you know, things that were left over. And I would say, dad, what are, what are they doing with those things? What, 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 like, what is that? And he said, well, that was the world's fair. And I would say, okay, but what are they doing with it now? And he would say, well, that was the world's fair. And I just thought like of spinal tap, like, well, like, you know, this one goes to 11, like, you know, that type of thing. <laughs> like, 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 cause it's, and I feel like we're going to be in that position at some point where mm-hmm. we're going to be looking at all this stuff. And it's like, well, what was, what was that? Like, we're just going to be looking well, at this stuff. And that saying, was, that was New York. Yeah, that was well, New York. <laughs> wow. That was New York. Uh, what are we doing with it now? Well, we're tearing, we're, we're tearing, tearing down the metal and, you know, turning into, <clears throat> you know, knives and uh, plowshares and uh, wagon wheel um, you know, <laughs> rims and things like that. Useful stuff like that. Yeah, okay, yeah. Um, actually, no, I, I take that back. There, there is another World's Fair that I, where the, I have been on the site. Um, I finished my college at the University of Washington in Seattle, and that was the location of the Alaska Yukon Pacific Exhibition back huh. about um, setting up for a century and a quarter ago. Hmm. And now nothing was left. They had to, they had turned it into a university after that and torn down all the temporary buildings and that kind of stuff. But that's the one other place that I've been to. I, I probably should have made time to visit the various remnants of World's Fair, such as they were in, say, Chicago or what have you. But I haven't. It hasn't been on my radar screen. Yeah, it's a, it's an interesting, um, you know, crumbling Futurama to see, you know, <laughs> uh, all those things that didn't happen. Some of them did. You know, all those things that Some didn't happen. <laughs> Oh yeah, one of one of the funniest things, and this is something I, I don't know. Somebody, if I can get, if I can talk a publisher into this, it'll, it'll involve a lot of investment in the graphics and research to do a history of the future we didn't get. Ooh, and because you know there are various futures as you go on, starting mm-hmm. from the you know the when the future first became a hot property um, in the in the 1870s and 1880s when people started really started going. What happens when we get air travel? Ooh, um, air travel, by the way, is, was supposed to make war impossible. Did you know that? <laughs> I think. Yeah, I think every new technology is supposed to oh, make every war, new technology, technology, war impossible. It's supposed to make war impossible. It's supposed to solve all our problems. You, you know, some of the people who wrote all of that, the drivel about how you know air travel was going to make war impossible, probably died in the bombing in World War Two. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. Um, but yeah, the, the air travel, and of course, everyone's idea of air travel back then was zeppelins, airships. That was going to be it. Of course, it wasn't. Um, there's this fascinating bit in, in one of Carl Jung's essays where he talks about the fact that he was dead wrong as a young man. He was convinced that heavier than air aircraft, well, airplanes, what we now think of as normal air flight, were of course impossible because they were heavier than air. It would have to be, you know, um, like balloons and zeppelins and dirigibles and things like that. And he's kind of looking back on that toward the end of his life, saying, "Hmm, this is a really good example of how one can believe something that's really plausible and completely stupid." But so many times we've had these futures deployed and everyone's going, oh, yes, here we are. I mean, growing up, 
um, in the in the late 1960s and through about half the 1970s, I was a Boy Scout, and I got Boy's Life, which was the Boy Scout magazine uh-huh. in those days. And they had you know, these these goofy little science fiction stories. Um, you know, they had this, this scout patrol, I think it was, that had found an abandoned time machine while on a camp on a camp out or something. And they went various places. And they went to the future. It was the most abs- I mean, the year two thousand. They used to have <laughs> amazing energy behind it. Yeah. What would be doing in the year two thousand? Well. <clears throat> Not what we thought we were going to be doing in the year 2000. Indeed, indeed, <laughs> indeed. Well, so I guess I guess that brings us to well, I guess I guess that brings us to well, I don't know if I'm going to start with my first question I had planned, but go ahead, well, yeah, whatever. Well, works. yeah, well, I, I think I think this does bring it to to it because I think the reason that we keep falling for these is that we're we have a hard time thinking about you know, complex mm-hmm. problems and, you know, complex systems. Um, and so the, the, the project you've, enge- uh, you know, set out on in your blog recently that I really like for lots of reasons um, is, is talking really about rhetoric, but not mm-hmm. in the, not in the pejorative sense that it usually mm-hmm. gets used today. Uh, the, the, mm-hmm. sh- the, the more like the more, might I say noble sense, or like I would say the shorthand I would use is understanding through dialogue. Um mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. and, and I, I feel that's very useful and I feel like it's something that I think actually more people are becoming interested in, um, mm-hmm. in, in my sort of like forays into YouTube and podcasting and, and such. Like mm-hmm. I'm noticing more and more people who are, are paying a lot of attention to that. Um, mm-hmm. and, and I just want to, I don't know, I, I guess, I, I guess I want, um, to, to talk, just talk a little bit about that. What, you know, what. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. To start with, yeah, we we have this notion that the word rhetoric means somebody trying to talk you into believing something that's not true. That's kind of our folk definition of rhetoric. And part of that is because the state of rhetoric, especially in the United States today, is dismal beyond compare. Um, I mean, if you can do this and not, not, you know, uh, suffer a sudden attack of vomiting, uh, try to remember all the speeches that were being made by the various candidates in the 2016 election. Oh, yeah. Now, admittedly, admittedly, we had some of the worst presidential candidates in the history of politics. Okay, we grant that. I grant that absolutely. But what a bunch of drivel <laughs> came out of everyone's mouths! And it wasn't just the candidates themselves. I mean, candidates are usually stupid. That's what they're there for. America has this thing. We're terrified of having presidents smarter than we are, so we have elected such a bunch of morons. Um, <laughs> You see, and but but it wasn't just the it wasn't just the campaign the, the the candidates, the campaigns, the bloggers, the the press releases, the the pundits were just spewing the most outrageous drivel, and I think that may have actually pushed things to the point that people are starting to go hold it. You know, words can be used to communicate something. You can actually say something with words that means something. You might even say, well, what about these problems that we have in our society? We have a lot of them, you know. Um, w- one of the things we can talk about with these words is, uh, you know, how, what are we going to do about them? And instead, well, we saw what we got. Uh, and Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, so the, but the thing is, one of the things that tends to happen in the, there's a kind of historical arc that societies go through. You go through a period where people are really convinced that we can know the truth about the world, the absolute, honest to God, um, you know, charcoal filtered, triple distilled truth about everything. And so, you know, the Greeks got into that, and they got into logic. They, in fact, they, they invented logic. In yeah. the process, they were completely convinced they were going to know the truth about everything. And in fact, what they what happened was they figured out, you know, logic, um, geometry, the, the the logical development of geometry that you see in Euclid. They 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 achieved these amazing things, but they discovered that it only went so far. Yeah. And that in particular, it fell flat on its nose right down on the on the on the ancient Greek pavement the moment it tried to deal with human affairs and especially politics. Mm. Now. We've been through the same cycle, and with us, it was science. 
Okay, you had people um, with the beginning of the scientific revolution back in the back in the, the late 1600s, amazing excitement, the possibility that we could understand everything about the world by using this hot new scientific method. It was great, and it, and we did we understood a lot of things. We learned things that the ancient Greeks never knew. We learned things that nobody had ever figured out before. But then we tried to apply it to human affairs and especially toward politics. And guess what? Whop, face down on the pavement. And what happens? And when people pick themselves up off the pavement and realize that this marvelous method of knowledge is limited, that it only goes so far, and then when it runs into the essential cussedness of human affairs, it fails by definition. Then you start realizing, okay, what do we do when we don't actually know what the truth is? What do we do when we're dealing with human affairs where everything is vague and everything is complex and everything is contradictory and probably half the people involved are lying and the other half are lying to themselves? <laughs> you know, how, do you do, how do you deal with... And then they start looking at rhetoric because rhetoric is about how you convince someone of something. It's about how you are convinced. It's about how you come to believe things. And as you study rhetoric and understand how arguments are created and how they're taken apart, you can find a way, bit by bit, to approach rhetoric as a way of knowledge, to say, okay, we don't know what the truth is, but we can identify that as a logical fallacy. Aha, that is crap. And anyone who says something like this is spewing crap, and we can just assume they're wrong. And so once you get into that, you have that transition from the, the, the sort of hubris of believing that you can know the truth to the sort of, um, you know, the, the, the sober realization that, well, you can't, but at least we can sort out, we can sort things out to some extent using the tools of rhetoric, using the tools of, um, here's a shocking phrase, the liberal arts. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, no, we can't, I mean, we have all these, all these universities most of which were founded to teach the liberal arts because people understood that a well-educated citizenry is, is the basic requirement for democratic governments. And then we threw all that out and turned them into basically job training for big corporations. Um, and the big corporations don't want liberal arts graduates because they want, they want drones. Yeah. They want people who will spew nonsense at the drop of a hat, who have no ethics, who have um, no, no boundaries, who will just do what they're told and, you know, and you don't get that from liberal arts graduates, not unless you've really debased your liberal arts programs. So we have – so history goes out the window. So literature goes out the window. Literature? Literature is how you understand how other people think. I mean when you read a novel, you're literally hearing someone else's thoughts inside your mind. They're not structured the way yours are. You get to experience someone else's mind, and it's by going through that experience a lot and thinking about it and doing it reflectively that you, come to the, you reach the point that you can actually interact with other people and treat them as human beings. Um, but of course, if you're if, you know, as a, as a, you know, if you're looking for a corporate job, that's a major disadvantage because uh, the corporations don't want you to be, treat other people as human beings. They're just production units or consumption units. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> uh, it was a really bad sign, if I may interject, when the, uh, the corporations all changed their personnel offices to human resources. <laughs> yes. What do you do with What do you do with the resource? Yes. You exploit it. Yes. And they do. <laughs> you know, they might as well just slap up a, something on there saying, "Hi, we're here to exploit you." It's such an yeah, it's, su it's such an objective term, you know. You resources, mm -hmm. it's it's you know resources. It's, it's, yeah, it's not it's something. Well, I grant I grant them honesty at least. They yeah, didn't try to yeah. cover it up with a nice, warm, you know, feel good phrase. It's just, "Hi, come here to be exploited." Yeah. You know, we'll pay you as little we can get away with and use you until you drop and then chuck you out. I'm I'm disappointed. <laughs> They're usually really good at that type of thing, you know? <laughs> yeah, you'd, you'd think they would have actually done some kind of vague, flowery, slightly new agey buzzword. And, but they didn't. You know, maybe they, maybe they just had a, you know, a bad brain cramp that day or something. <laughs> ah, indeed, indeed. Yeah, um, and so, yeah, so you brought up the um you know how 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 the quality of writing you know mm -hmm. the quality of writing has we really are thinking along with somebody um mm -hmm. and this is this is kind of a frustration i've had um uh, starting to make youtube videos and uh, it's it's kind of a tension that, it, that that i feel because on the one hand i like the platform because mm -hmm. it allows me to reach a lot of people there's an mm -hmm. algorithm um you know and 
there's lots of people talking about the same thing and that, you know, connects the people via algorithm and I can reach a large audience. Mm-hmm. On the other hand, mm-hmm. uh, you know, there is too much time that I need to put into producing the video and making it mm-hmm. a product that somebody wants to watch. Now, there's different ways of sidestepping that by just kind of having a static image and speaking or, you know, just kind of having myself speak to the camera, which is kind of mm-hmm. no one really wants the to talking, say. The yeah. talking heads of doom. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> uh, um, so I guess I guess the question I have for you is, how do you, how, 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 how do we address this, this tension between you know, really trying to reach people, um, but actually having something to say. Because I find sometimes, you know, it's difficult to get both in the same package. I feel there's a mm-hmm. lot of people who mm-hmm. have a compelling way to communicate something and put a lot into that aspect. And then, you know, but it's also very easy to really have something to say and not have anybody hear it because you're, mm-hmm. you know, not interacting in the right medium or you're not packaging it right. Mm-hmm. You know, there, there's a, there's a real tension there. I feel like and there, there, there is, I am probably the wrong person to ask <laughs> you though, because I have literally broken every rule in terms of how you're supposed to make an impact via the internet. Okay. Yeah. I put, po- I mean, I, I am the, I am the, the, the apotheosis of teal deer. Okay. <laughs> I write these long, wordy, complicated, um, you know, literary essays. I post them once a week on a blog that does not advertise anywhere. And for some reason, I get tens of thousands of people coming to read these things. I have no idea why that works. I really don't. Yeah. Um, you know, literally, I, the, the, when, when, I switched, when, when I switched from the Archdrew Report to Ecosophia, um, and that, the complicated story having to do with the problems with Blogger and things like that. But um, when I made that switch, the new, the new software on the new, on the new site um, has this thing that kind of grades each of your um, posts on your blog to say, well, does it have these approved features? And mine never has most of them. <laughs> and then the thing's just sitting there growling at me saying, you're not following the program. Yeah. And I'm saying, that's right. <laughs> but... Um, I don't know if it's just that you know every every normal curve has to have its far end. Uh-huh. I don't know if it's because um, because I really am saying something that is so different from what anyone else is saying that people are uh, coming just for the shock value. I don't know what it is, but I have systematically ignored all the rules of what you're supposed to do, and in particular, I have I am I am completely uninterested in doing things via YouTube, doing things you know via um, any medium more um, more modern than text. Yeah, you know, my if if this were fifty or a hundred years ago, my stuff would be appearing in in magazines. Mm-hmm. I'd have a column in in a weekly magazine, most likely, and it wouldn't look that different. And so um, I don't know, you know, there is that tension. I don't know if this will work for anyone else, but mm-hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm suddenly remembering uh, Hunter S. Thompson's famous comment, you know, about how um, he would not recommend, you know, um, strange drugs and hot sex and wild living to anyone else, but they've always worked for him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> in, the, in the same way, I don't know that it would work for anyone else to simply ignore the rules and um, write what I want to write with complete disregard for um, what's supposed to attract an audience and get an audience, but it has always worked for me. Mm. So, you know, just, just one of those things. Um, one, one thing that I think might be involved is simply that so many people are following the rules Mm -hmm. that there's kind of a traffic jam. It's as though, you know, all the street signs are saying, you know, if you want to go to Peoria, let's say, okay, you need to take exit 14 and go down highway one. Okay. And so everyone's on Highway 1, and Highway 15, a mile over there, is dead empty. Yeah. So I'm going over to Highway 15 because I like the scenery. And all of a sudden I'm finding, you know, there's like three cars on the road between here and the Illinois border. Hmm. And yeah. somehow it works for me. So it may, it may just be there are too many people trying to do the, the thing that, uh, you know, the, 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 the rules say you're trying to do. I, I think, don't Yeah, I think that might be a big part of it. I think you might have hit something there. Mm-hmm. Um. Yeah, the the other thing that I've I've noticed uh, trying to have discourse on the internet is what I'm mm-hmm. was what 
somebody else has called electrical energy. Um, you know, you get this type of thing where uh, you know, it creates more heat than light. Um, <laughs> mm-hmm. you, you know, um, it, you get very, it's, you know, it's, it, it, it lends itself to polemics, which lend mm-hmm. themselves to more polemics because mm-hmm. that just infuriates mm-hmm. and, and enrages and it just, mm-hmm. and, it, and, mm-hmm. and it, and it starts this type of thing. And, and in your old block, block, in your old blog, you talked a little bit about propaganda and mm-hmm. the, like the blowback that certain mm-hmm. kinds of propaganda create. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And I found that interesting. Um, could you actually, like, could you talk a little bit about that? Because that seems very relevant today because I definitely see, uh, you know, in the in the kind of the internet culture, a, a lot of that, <laughs> a lot, a well, lot of that. Yeah. A lot of what's going on here is on the one hand, um, the, the grand old habit of preaching to the choir. Mm-hmm. People who are doing propaganda that is aimed at the people who already agree with them. And that's very easy to do, and it's very comfortable because you don't have to leave your comfort zone at all. But it obviously completely fails to touch anybody who doesn't already agree with you. And a lot of what we have going on now, right, you know, in, in American public life, choose a side, and it's got its point of view and the other side, and it spends all its time screaming insults at the other side because they're not listening to the obvious truth of our point. You know, this is not merely propaganda. This is failed propaganda. Mm. This is lousy propaganda. You actually have to address the other person. So there's that. But a lot of what's going on on the Internet is simply um, – I forget the name of the theory, but it, somebody has worked out a, a, an amusingly titled theory, which is based on the fact that if you give people anonymity, a significant number of them will act like jerks. Yeah. And if, oh, if you give them anonymity and then don't call them – don't make them responsible for their actions, they'll act like jerks. Yeah. Now, it is actually fairly easy to stop people from doing this. There are two ways of doing it, um, and I've done one, and the, the Russian government has done the other. Okay, so this probably proves that I'm not um, you know, Boris Badenov or something like that. <laughs> but um, the, in, in Russia, my understanding is Russia right now, um, you can't be anonymous online. It's against the law. Yeah, they, and in fact, there are fairly stiff legal penalties for using internet anonymizers and things like that. They're just, their rule is very simple. If you're going to put something online, your real name is going to be connected to it. Hmm. Um, that, that seems very reasonable to me. Yeah. That seems extremely reasonable to me, but I don't expect it to happen in the U.S. This, you know, anytime, yeah. you know, anytime this side of the 12th, never. What I do, on the other hand, is that I moderate all comments. And I get... Uh, let's see, about one every three months now. It used to be much more common, but one every three months. I get these long tirades about how I'm suppressing people's freedom of speech. <laughs> what I'm suppressing is people's freedom to be jerks. Yeah. Okay? And so I, I, I post the rules. I enforce the rules. If somebody's enough of a jerk, I IP ban them, and they are never heard from again. Um, if they're interesting enough in their trolling, I, I may not. I just read their <laughs> posts and then delete them. Um, but, yeah, the thing is, there is – there is a real suction in the direction of being a jerk. Be- and we'll get, we'll get to the reasons for that, because there's actually a very important reason for that, that that shapes modern society profoundly. But if you simply don't let them do it, if you simply hit that, hit that delete button anytime somebody crosses one of the lines, all of a sudden people start having great conversations again. Yeah. And this is something that I've, I've, heard, I've heard for years on my blogs, and in various other forms that I've had to, I've had control over, um, people are going, "Wow, you know, you have such great conversations." And I'm going, "Well, yes, that's because <laughs> that's because I, you know, I, I I hit the trolls over the head and toss them back under their bridges." Um, now, the reason why being a jerk is there's such an addictive power to that is the tyranny of mandatory niceness in today's society. Hmm. I did a post uh, last year. Yeah. Um, title hate is the new sex yes pointing out that our ideas about hate are exactly like the ideas about sex in the victorian in victorian england okay oh no no we can't have that you know nobody should possibly be exposed to to sex or hate hate is a perfectly normal natural human emotion we all feel it we all have it it's not just those hate groups going speaking hate speech over there it's in all of us and it's only because we've turned it into this big, you know, overblown taboo that it's any kind of problem. But 
because it's so taboo, because we've got that, this tyranny of mandatory niceness in place, people are desperate to hate. Just, you know, they're like you know, people in Victorian England who were desperate to get laid. Who just, they wanted to look at, an, at somebody's naked body or they wanted to actually have sex. It drove them crazy. They engaged in all kinds of absurd and, and, and often very cruel things just because that, the, the desire to express that natural, normal human desire for sexuality um, was literally driving them nuts. We are in exactly the same place with hatred. Um, people, you know, hate is normal. Everybody does it. Everybody has those ceilings. Everybody, you know, it's a real thing. It can't be gotten rid of. And bottling it up just means that people get hypocritical about it. And so all these people who are rushing out online so they can spew hatred at someone, like, you know, Victorian gentlemen sneaking away to a whorehouse. Yeah. It's in exactly the same spirit. So um, the, the, the secret here is on the one hand um, – you know, don't just you know, please. This this you know, this is a living room, not a house. Go go, you know, exercise your appetite somewhere else. But more broadly, I'd like to see people fess up and deal with it. And, and this is one of the places, by the way, where I think Donald Trump is doing something really useful for society, <laughs> because an enormous number of people who have convinced themselves that hate is bad and they cannot hate, and you know, only haters hate. You know, they feel perfectly comfortable hating Donald Trump. And being very public about their hatred of Donald Trump. And it's actually really good for them psychologically. Now, my guess is that the Democrats are going to throw the 2020 election, and Trump's going to win quite, com quite easily then, precisely because that means they've got four more years where they can hate without guilt. Hmm. I'm hoping by the time that's over, they'll actually have come to terms with the fact that, you know, we're human beings. We hate. That's just part of who we are. It's not a bad thing. It's normal. Just try to do it you know, try to do it responsibly um, with consenting adult. we could get into all the parallels there yeah, um, yeah. but you know I'm hope that, hoping I'm hoping that we as a society grow out uh, grow past that this this frankly idiotic notion that that hate is is bad and wrong and must be must be suppressed must be repressed and um, you know must be banished utterly because it's bad and we're all good you know, come on yeah, yeah, that 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 particular blog really I that was one of my pr favorites that you've done in the last year or so. Thank you. Cuz that Thank you. That it, it rattled some cages. I was very pleased. Yeah, yeah. Well, cuz I I think of the Trump is definitely cuz this is your most recent blog, I believe. Mm -hmm. He's definitely a reflection of of, you know, of of America, you know. Exactly. He's he's you know, people will sit and tweet about how horrible his tweets are, and, and you know they'll they'll, 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 they'll they'll yeah tweet storms in response to his tweet storms. Yeah, yeah exactly. it's, it's just and they don't see it. It's 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 amazing. And they don't see it. No, it's the, the thing is that that's that's the thing about um what what you what you contemplate you imitate right what you contemplate you imitate. These people are staring at Donald Trump so much they're going to start sprouting orange hair. <laughs> yeah. Watch, <laughs> because yeah, he is. He the, one of the things that one of the things that gets going when you get these very strange return of the repressed kind of phenomena going on. Hate and love are much closer together than most people realize, mm -hmm. because they're both based on total emotional commitment to the other person. Mm -hmm. You know, the the opposite of love is not hate. The opposite of love is apathy. Yeah. The opposite of love is meh. Who cares? Um, and love, you know, love-hate relationships exist. They're fairly common yeah. because they're based on the same level of emotional commitment. And so, watch what happens over the next six years or so with a lot of these people who are screeching about Trump. Just, yeah, I suspect it's going to be really rather strange. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, what this, I, 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 for a connoisseur of collective psychology, especially the weirder ends of collective psychology, the whole, you know, tr the whole phenomenon of quote the resistance. Unquote, oh my goodness, is just it, it's it, it's endlessly interesting. Yeah, what what I what I say to those people who you know who who march in government approved protests? Look, if you really want to annoy Trump, start occupying his golf courses. <laughs> 
until you're ready to yeah. do that, until you're ready to do that, drop the resistance uh, moniker. Mm-hmm. You're not in you're not in Vichy France. It's not. Uh, mm-hmm. t- well, and if you were in Vichy France, what are you actually doing? <laughs> Yeah. Uh, the thing is, the, 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 one, of, one of the other things that's going on here, um, this, is, this is something, and this is another thing that used to be primarily on the right and has gradually sort of seeped over onto the left, living life as a representation of itself. Yes. Um, year, many years ago, I, I, had, I had occasion to visit um, some family members of a friend of mine. And these people lived in um, rural eastern Washington, which is the West, okay? It's the mm-hmm. dryland West, cattle range country, mm-hmm. okay? Their house was basically a kind of old West museum. There were all of these, you know, old west e things all over the place. All the decor was faux old West, and they're living in the middle of the West with cows, out in the fields, and yet they were living lives as this kind of representation of itself. It's this kind of where they're not just living; they're they're going through, they're acting out parts. And we saw a lot of that on the on the right in the religious right, especially watching people act out the part of being devout Christians. When of course they were, you know, the the ministers were running off to to you know get banged by their boyfriends on yeah, Saturday nights yeah. and things like that. And, and, you know, and all this kind of nonsense was going on, but they were all acting. These days you get a lot of that on the left too. And the resistance, I think, is a classic example of it. These people are play-acting, being members of the French resistance. They're going through all the motions. They're making the gestures. They're, they're watching themselves carefully in the mirror to make sure their pose is just right. <laughs> and one of the problems with living life as a representation of itself is that you're too, if you're too busy posing, you're not actually going to accomplish anything mm. other than watching yourself in the mirror and going, yeah, I'm striking that pose so well. You know, what's actually happening? What's actually happening in the case of the resistance is that um, Democrat, uh, Democratic um, numbers in the polls are sliding week after week yeah. after week. And um, the Republicans are climbing week after week after week. And all the the um, loud yelling about the blue wave that was going to sweep the Republicans out of mm-hmm. office in the 2018 elections. And then we can impeach Trump and get President Pence. Yeah. Uh, I, 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 right. Yeah, come I, on. <laughs> I love that. I love that. I love that line of thinking because I, 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 yeah. I, I try and I try and just follow it. I'm like, so. You want to get rid of Trump because you don't like him, so you want to put this evangelical Christian in. And, well, they do. And, and then, and then, who's next? Uh-huh. Paul Ryan. I mean, he's going to be out soon. But it just you just go down the line, and you're like, are you thinking? Exactly. Yeah, have you thought this no. through? You just you no. just you just no. want to you just want to like release. You know, it's yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. It's all about striking the pose. It's all about feeling the emotion. And you know, one of the things, one of the this is this is actually. This is something I'm going to want to explore further, is to what extent you get people who are, you know, it's not just their living life as representation, representation of itself. They're feeling feelings as representations of themselves. They're not mm-hmm. actually feeling anger. They're going through the action of anger because that way they can feel something at all. Hmm. It's, you know, there's this very theatrical, very hollow quality to the whole thing. And... Mm-hmm. Just there's there's some strange things going on. One of the things that that I've noticed historically, this kind of thing happens right before major shifts, major shifts mm. in in politics, major shifts in culture, and you know we may have actually seen the sort of um, the the grand American liberal movement that actually got started back in the 18 teens with its sort of elitist idea that we can make the world perfect um, if we just, you know, take the ed- if the educated people just tell everyone else what to do. And um, all the utopian dreams that were piled up on that, all this stuff, it may have actually passed its poll date. And we may see a major realignment into political alignments that nobody can really envision yet because they haven't be- they've only just begun to take shape. Yeah, it's you know there there is a real sense as though you know the pe- even the people who are yelling the loudest don't really believe it anymore. 
Well, that's why they have to yell so loudly. They, they, they're good point. Good yeah, point. You know, I mean, that, that, that's often, they're often trying to convince themselves more than anything else. Yeah. Um, and at this point, they're, are they even con- trying to convince themselves or are they trying, simply going through the motions of, of enacting the, the, the play of trying to convince themselves? Yeah, because they, don't, they don't, know, don't know what else to do. What you were, exactly. just, what you were just speaking to a moment ago um, about you know, people being very stuck in the representation um, reminds mm-hmm. me of – I haven't read it, but I've heard people talk about uh, – uh, some of the situationists, the guy yeah. on the board, and and and, and mm-hmm, that, mm-hmm. that 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 yes. shift. Society of the spectacle. Yeah, so society yes. of the spectacle. Yes. Yeah. No, the, the the situationists actually have had a huge impact on my thinking, uh, because they they really did get into the whole idea of, you know, um, the difference between uh, living and and you know the representation of life mm-hmm. and how you know how the how the the, the the system, if you will, to use the grand old 60s term, the system convinces us to hand over our own capacities so they can sell us back um, shoddy technological limitations. Yeah. You know, instead of instead of ma- making bread is my favorite example here, uh-huh. okay? It's a perfectly natural, perfectly normal thing. You can do it with a bowl and a spoon and your hands and, of course, the ingredients. And it's really a sweet activity. And yet, Instead of doing this, um, we forget how to do that, and then we buy um, basically packaged styrofoam from the um, grocery store, or maybe we buy a bread machine, which <laughs> does exactly what we would do with our hands and costs a lot of money and uses a lot of power and takes a lot to clean. And why? Because we've given over our capacities to the machine, and we're taking back you know, an, an artificial a representation of it. Um, I see that. I see television as an example of that. Television is is the is the surrogate imagination. Mm-hmm. Okay, instead of having an imagination, instead of having your own thoughts, your own dreams, your own imaginations, you have your shows. Yeah. Which te- you know, which I mean, oh. how many people ever stop to think? Stop to think. Why do they call it programming? Yes, yes, that's a good. What's point. on television? Why do they call it that? What's being but programmed? What yeah? What is being programmed, and who's doing the programming, and who in whose interests is the programming being done? I, uh, yes, we want us the precious. I I bake <laughs> when the weather's when the weather's cooler. I I like to bake mm-hmm. bread, and people will ask mm-hmm. me, "Oh, do do you have a bread machine?" And I will say, "You're yeah. look you're you're looking at it. You're looking at it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and do they do they get uncomfortable and change the subject?" No, they, 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 I, 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 try, I try to put it across in the, 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 the most jovial tone. So I go, ah, you're okay, looking yeah. at it. But yeah. <laughs> uh-huh. Okay. Well, hey, at least they don't just, sort of just get uncomfortable and back away. <laughs> um, I've, I've seen that kind of thing. It, it's, you know, um, people, people are very uncomfortable about this kind of thing. And I think it's because they know that they're missing, they, that, you know, they could ditch some of the machines and have a life but you know for whatever reason they've convinced themselves that they can't or they shouldn't or what have you um yeah. there's, there's a lot of ambi- there's a lot of ambivalence behind the the sort of knee-jerk um faith in progress the knee-jerk belief in technology i'm thinking here of um this this is many years ago i was involved in an organization called the society for the eradication of television oh yes and yeah, one of the things that one of the things we did as as a fundraiser from time to time was we would get a bunch of defunct television sets from um, Goodwill and places like that. You could get them there at that time, and we would get those, and we'd get a bunch of long-handled sledgehammers and the big face shields that you use in like machine shop or what have you, and heavy-duty aprons and heavy-duty gloves, and we would spread a big tarp. In a, in a place, having gotten a permit and this kind of stuff. Yeah. And then we would set up, we'd set up banners and so on, announce that anybody who wanted to could take a hammer to one of those televisions. 25 cents a whack. It was a fundraiser. Um, it was fascinating to watch because you'd get a small crowd and people would look really nervous and usually one of us would have to go out and actually hit the first, you know, bash a television for the first time because, just, because people weren't, you know, can you actually do this? Is anyone actually going to go ahead and do this? Once you get started, the enthusiasm with which people would pound televisions to flinders. I, I remember one time this very demure, very nicely dressed woman 
in in attractive clothes, well made up, obviously, you know, um, relatively well to do, um, wielding a five pound sledge and a long <laughs> handle, yelling like a banshee, and pounding a television to to powder. I mean, she stuffed a twenty dollar bill in the guy's hand and said, "Well, you know, okay, I want, I want this one." And just literally reduced it to reduced it to crumbs, yelling, you know, screeching like a banshee the whole time. And I'm just thinking, okay, there's a lot of a lot of people don't let themselves realize how much they hate the machine, how much they hate, you know, this habit they have. Yeah, or 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 the. Or being or having a relationship to the machine where you mm-hmm. are completely subservient to it. One of the things yeah. I, I, I found interesting a few weeks ago, um, your blog you discuss where you were discussing the dulcimer. Um, mm-hmm. You were discussing how many people, you know, this isn't something that's limited to uh, just you know more older older technologies. You know, some people used to you know build their own synthesizers, and there's actually oh, yeah. there's actually a guy on YouTube. Whose channel mm-hmm. I, I particularly like? Uh, it's mm-hmm. called it's called Look Mom No Computer, and that's what he does. <laughs> he 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 builds his own synthesizers, and mm-hmm. he, you know he one of the things I've saw, seen him do. He made an oscilloscope out of an old TV. Um, oh yeah. He had to discharge the energy first, which apparently there's enough. Uh, oh yeah. The the, <laughs> capa- the capacitors are loaded with high voltage, and yeah. you've got to discharge that, or you will fry. Yeah. But okay. yeah, so clearly he knew his business. He discharged the capacitors. There was lots of blue sparks. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm, yeah. But but th- that's that's interesting. That's interesting. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. And the thing is that well, I will be more I will be more impressed with the maker movement as it starts moving away from um, 3D printing. Oh. Ooh, we can make a computer do something oh. else useless. Okay, oh, and into, here are hand tools. Yes. Here are power tools. Do something with them. Yeah. Because that's when you actually start getting into mastery. You start getting into the development of skill. You start having that, that relationship between your physical body and the work you're doing that can teach you so much and actually give you a life rather than just handing things over to the machine. That um that that actually bugged me a few years ago. I went to a uh, technology conference. It was when I was uh-huh. still trying to uh, get my ebook sharing uh, platform up and running, and uh-huh. you know the, the things that everyone was swooning over was three D printing, three D printing, uh-huh. and it's it could make a it could make a crappy plastic model that you Ooh, could, yeah, couldn't exactly, couldn't yeah. really do anything with, and the machine costs you know, hundreds of dollars. And, you mm-hmm. know, I saw, I saw a piece on the, the creator of the company maybe about a year ago now n- talking about like, oh, this, you know, didn't fizzle out. This, this was a big bust. And I'm like, yeah, what did you think it was going to do? It's, mm-hmm. it's just, it, it, yeah. people get, people the, get very attached to the image of where it's going and what they, mm-hmm. what they have emotionally invested in it or, you know, mm-hmm. what, what type of thing they can think can fill. And they don't actually, Say well, what does this actually do? What 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 mm-hmm. is this like? They they mm-hmm. they're just thinking, you know, Star Trek, and it's gonna be, you know. Oh God! Yeah. Any, seriously, anytime anybody brings up that TV show in relation to technology, you know that nonsense is about to come out. <laughs> I, seriously, it is the it is the absolute um, touchstone of the tenth rate of of, of the tenth rate techn, you know technological fetishism of our time. Anytime people start talking about Star Trek, um, you know, maybe it's just me. Maybe it's just that I watched the original series in its original run. Yeah. Okay. It's... And it's not, it was, even then, it was pretty hackneyed. I, I could never, it's one of those things that I mm-hmm. love science fiction when I was young. Mm-hmm. I could never get into, I think it was the, the next generation it was running when I was a teenager or whenever. Uh-huh. I, I, could, mm-hmm. I, could, I could never, I could never. I can never well, it was just yeah. I, I I've I've never watched any of the later ones. It was the original series. The original series is the only one I ever experienced. Yeah. But even then, it was just you know everything was just 1960s in in funny clothes and fun you know a little bit of extra makeup. The Klingons were the Russians. The Romulans were the Chinese. The Vulcans were the Japanese. Um, you know the Federation is the United States, and you know Admiral James or Captain James T. Kirk is General William Westmoreland pacifying his, <laughs> his extraterrestrial <laughs> Vietnam. 
Mm. Uh, it was just it was the same stuff. It was the same stuff you saw in any any other program. And watching the um the the dro- slobbering adulation that that show got. You know, and and even to this day, watching you know cheap cliches from Star Trek being used as a replacement for thinking about things. They're yes. replicators. Um, I mean, I've had people try to insist to me the tractor beams actually work. <laughs> okay, they don't. There's no there's no effect known to science that will do a tractor beam, and um, you know, and things like that. There's, it's just come on, guys. You know, take off your Spock ears. Yeah, put yeah. them away. Well, and, and let you know. The, the thing is, there there were better even at the time there was better science fiction out there. Yeah, the Twilight Zone, Outer Limits. Oh, you know, oh yeah, yeah. My, my, a little earlier, a little earlier. And then, yeah, then, that's right. Yeah, and then a little little later, the one that the one that I actually really loved back in the day was Space Nineteen Ninety Nine. Huh. Yeah, I don't know if you even remember. No, that. I, I, I'm, I'm too, I'm too young to even. Yeah, I, I can I, say, yeah, it, I've never even it heard was, of it. I, that, yeah, it was the, the, the idea, the idea was that there was a moon base and um, they had been storing all of the um, Earth's nuclear waste on the backside of the moon, and there was an explosion, hmm. and it sent the moon zooming out at um, extremely, at relativistic speeds out, and, and but what they had was a kind of, a, it was a believable early 21st century technology. Uh huh. Yeah, that, and that's that, all they had, yeah. and it was it was really it was really rather fun, huh. and you know some of, some of it was stupid. It was it was more British than American, as I recall. But it was it was a fun show. Um, but the thing is, the the science fiction the science fiction that I liked in those days, as opposed to the fantasy, which is where my um, where more of my interest went, um, was much more realistic than the Star Trek stuff. Mm-hmm. It was actually you know let's let's talk about space travel using technologies that are actually plausible. Yeah, you know, let's see, forget about the lithium crystals. There are none. <laughs> yeah, the um, uh, well, you had mentioned Kim Stanley Robinson earlier, and uh, mm-hmm. I recently read uh, what is it, Aurora? Aurora. And, oh, and... oh, that one, that one threw a cat among the pigeons in the mm-hmm. science fiction community. I, I bet, I bet, because mm-hmm. uh, because really, and you know, he did it. He did it. I think. I think he did it perfectly because he he laid out, you know, he mm-hmm. gave, he gave he gave every pass technologically that you could you yeah. could give. He's like, okay, well, you know what? Maybe we get this. All right, yeah, okay, maybe we get this. Maybe we pull this mm-hmm. off. Maybe all right. Even if we pull all these things off, even if we get the technology, we don't have the ecology. You're not gonna get anything living on another you know, on this, on, a, on another planet. Cause it's either going to be dead and you're not going to be able to live there or terraform it, or it's going to be alive and it's going to kill you. And, <laughs> yeah. Or it's just, yeah, exactly. You know? Um, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it, that, that was, that was such a breath of fresh air. Yeah. You know, and to see, to see somebody actually talking about, t- talking about the real issues, some of the real issues, there are many others, of course, um, I'm still waiting to see somebody actually talk seriously about the fact that um, outer space, once you get outside the Van Allen belts, uh, the outside of the magnetosphere, outer space is full of hard radiation. Yeah. And, you know, we were talking about Elon Musk a while ago, and he's, we're going to put people on Mars. You know, by the time you take somebody to Mars by, the home, by a home in orbit and bring them back, they're dying of radiation poisoning. Yeah. Well, uh, a, lot of people, <laughs> yeah. a lot of people are talking now like, oh, I don't know what we're going to do. All the all, all the rich people are gonna are gonna move off Earth and leave us here. It's like, oh no, please don't do that. Please, <laughs> please, please don't, please don't all, please all the billionaires, please don't go. No, no, don't don't leave us. Don't don't no, leave us here. <laughs> I, I think it's, I, yeah. I, it would I, I I if I if I had way too much money, the thought of trying to con the world's billionaires into a one-way trip to Mars. Maybe that's what he's doing. Maybe he's he's actually he's <laughs> maybe he's actually just playing a long con. You know, maybe he is. I, I think the thing is, I, I have an enormous amount of a kind of sidelong respect for Elon Musk because the man has figured out that at this point in American history, the only way you can really effectively get rich um, 
in the U.S. economy we have now is by sponging off the government. Yeah, you know, and he's good. really good at it. Every single one of his business things is based on soaking up government funding. And, you know, somebody's going to be soaking up that funding. Might as well be him. It's just that that's all it is. Yeah. I mean, his whole solar, the, the whole, you know, all the solar stuff that he was doing has been quietly shelved as subsidies have dropped away. Yeah. And if the Tesla doesn't get um, the kind of subsidies it was getting, it, it's doomed. I mean, it's doomed anyway. Uh, yeah, it's... But, yeah, everything he's done is a subsidy dumpster. It's just a way, a way to, to, you know, slurp off the, um, the, the government's nipple. He has a small stake in a company that is doing uh, home geothermal heating much cheaper. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't, mm-hmm. I don't know. You know, but again, lots yeah. of su- lots, lots of subsidies. Lots of subsidies. You lots. Know, like... And the thing is, there there are some subsidies that may actually be useful. And I'm home, you know, the sort of home geothermal that I've seen, um, you know, heat pumps based on using the earth as a as a heat sink. It's not a bad plan. Yeah, I I I looked at it recently at a home show mm-hmm. and. I think two years ago there was a company selling it, and I forget what the price mm-hmm. was, but it it dropped in it, it 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 was halved basically when I looked at it a few months ago. Good, yeah. And, and the thing, yeah, and the thing is that's there's there's a lot of small scale technologies like that that could be deployed very effectively to make people a lot more comfortable as you know as we run to the next round of energy shortages, which is about eh, two three years off now. Yeah, yeah. That that that's something that. That's actually something that, that that we should talk a little bit more about mm-hmm. because, um, sure. you know, one of the things, you know, I think I've definitely, I was probably heading there before I started reading your work, mm-hmm. um, but one thing that really, you know, shifted me more towards that was, was reading you and trying to think about, you know, ways to use energy. I actually just put up a, a, our clothesline yesterday. I probably Sweet. was putting it off mm-hmm. way too long. Um, <laughs> pouring cement is easier than I thought it was. Um, yeah, well, there you go. No, and now you know that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but you know, some of the uh, uh, how, how to actually get these technologies out there, and how to actually subsidize them in a way that doesn't just subsidize you know people who have the means, people who can pay yeah. for it, and then get the tax write off later. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. it, like is there a way to do that or is that is that a hard road to hoe? Like Well, no, no, it, it can be done, but the problem is that the entire the entire focus of our political system for the last 40 years has been dedicated to handing over goodies to the upper 20%. Hmm. Okay? The middle classes, the privileged middle classes, the people who are yelling about the 1% most of them are members of the 20%. Yeah. And, um, you know, and these are the people who um, you talk to them about the working class and you will hear f- a fine display of hate speech. I mean, if you really oh, want to hear yeah. American hate speech these days, get a bunch of privileged middle class liberals talking about working class Americans. You will hear um, a degree of stereotyping and nastiness that would make the Ku Klux Klan turn pink with envy. Um, <laughs> Yeah, but but yeah, no. The thing is, they've been the they've been the re, on the receiving end of all the goodies, and that's why it's done so little good. Because of course, you know, there a there's not that many of them. B, uh, you know, there's just just twenty percent of the population. B, everything they do is focused on maintaining their own their own status markers, their own class markers, their own state of privilege, and their own perks. So they're not going to cut back in any way that matters. Um, the, years ago. I lived for my wife and I lived for five years in the town of Ashland, Oregon, which is um, it used to be a very pleasant little college town in the far far southwestern Oregon, about 14 miles north of the California border. These days, it's the northernmost suburb of Orange County. <laughs> um, <clears throat> it's it's full of Californians, and this is the place where, um, the, of course, lots of houses have um, have uh, solar panels. Mm-hmm. But a great many of the solar panels don't actually do any good because uh, the way the streets are laid out, a lot of them, you know, if you want solar panels facing the street so your neighbors can, so that everyone can see them driving by, they have to be on the north north side of the roof <laughs> where they don't get any sunlight. <laughs> and that's where they are because they're status symbols, and that's all they are. Yeah. This is also the town where I encountered the uh, bumper sticker, live simply that others may simply live on the biggest SUV I have ever seen, <laughs> which will give you an idea. But the thing is, that's, that's the issue. The class barrier is what has to be broken. 
And if we if we were to rearrange things so that so that you know some amount of the goodies were to be shared with the with the eighty percent with the working classes and the poor, if we if our government was not so fixated on handing out more goodies to the people who are already comfortable and privileged, it'd be a piece of cake. It'd be very easy to set things up. So you first of all, you don't do it by tax subsidies because by you know tax rebates because most of the poor don't pay enough taxes to pay for a solar system. Yeah. Okay. But there are many proven ways you can do it. You can fund it. You can do zero interest loans. You can do out outright grants. You could there's just a range of things. And you know, since all this would involve jobs, you know, you're hiring people to install things, you're hiring people to build things. It it's a great it's 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 a, it's it's a no it's it's a no brainer. And so, but you do this, and you the goal is to make sure, first of all, that every um, multifamily residence in the United States has some of these simple things, like um, solar water heating. Mm. In most of the United States, you can cut 10% off a household's energy use by slapping on a solar water heater. It will only work, you know, even if it only works three, you know, um, three seasons of the year, as it often will. I mean, down in the South, good Lord, yeah. you get all your hot water for free. Yeah. Okay, it's a known technology. It's proven stuff. It's, it works very well. Um, it would take a lot of burden off the utilities, and it could be done so easily. And nobody's doing it because you know we're all focusing on on shoveling shoveling yeah. goodies into the into the lap of the middle class. Yeah. And it, and it would put a lot of working class people locally to work. You know, putting, uh, yeah, installing exactly. those things, but installing know? these things. Yeah, this take this takes plumbers. This takes carpenters. This takes you know guys who climb around on roofs with with ladders and nails exactly. And you know um, so you, you've got this possibility. You got and there's a lot of other things. Things like this the the sort of home the the home shallow geothermal thing, which can be used in most places. And again, takes a big chunk off your heating and yeah. cooling. And, the, and so you know the again these are these are easy. Yeah. They're straightforward. They could make a huge difference, but because they don't make the middle class even more comfortable than than it already is. Nobody wants to talk about them. I I suspect that as the polit as the um, the politics of um, the current presidential um, inmate continue to cycle through, uh, that may change hmm. because it is just beginning to sink in that there's a lot of people out there who have been left out in the cold by the the sort of um, middle class centric politics of the last forty years. And they're willing to vote. Give them a candidate who who is willing to give them anything, and they'll vote for him. And um, you know, the Hillary Clintons of the world will have to go home and find something else to do with all of that confetti. Uh, uh, well, that actually that actually brings me to something that um, I'm very grateful to you for, um, mm -hmm. because you know I read your piece on Donald Trump and the politics of resentment in January mm -hmm. of 2016. 2016, yeah, oh and, yeah. And before any of the primaries. And mm -hmm. that mentally and emotionally prepared me for the possibility that he could win. And, mm -hmm. you know, it, there was only one brief point, and it was like a few days after, you know, the, the locker room talk where I, I I thought, oh, okay, maybe maybe he's sunk, maybe that maybe he's finally gone too far. But then his <laughs> then his then his numbers his numbers went up again. Then his numbers yeah. went up again, and I was just and my wife and I we both were watching that whole you know that that whole fall like just just like watching the debates mostly for entertainment purposes because mm -hmm. I, I I watch him and it's just it's it's surreal. Um, but mm -hmm. but watching and just. Just looking and saying, "This is going to happen. This guy's going to mm -hmm. be president," and all these people true. around me having no clue, and then uh -huh. it, ha it happened, and I and... watched the freak out, and uh -huh. it hasn't really ended for a lot of people. I know, and, I know, and, and I'm still. It's amazing. It's um, people mm -hmm. still haven't learned the the simple things you were talking about. Before the primaries, mm -hmm. it's two years later, and they're still. There's, uh, well, th there was there was one additional factor that I did not count on that made his victory certain. Um, I assumed that Hillary Clinton was going to run a bad campaign. Yeah. Because um, the her campaign back in um, 2008, when she was running against Barack Obama, yeah. um, she, if she had had 
any kind of political skill if her campaign had not been a complete failure, um, she would have taken the nomination, no question. And Barack Obama was able to scoop it out from her because her campaign was so incompetent. I did not think she would manage to do something even worse. And she did. I'm hoping that once the Democrats finish going through, or, you know, I don't know, maybe the Democratic Party falls apart, or whatever party replaces it then, we'll actually look at Hillary Clinton's campaign in 2016 from beginning to end as the perfect example of how to lose. Mm. Yeah. Because it's, it, I mean, I've watched presidential candidate campaigns since 1968. Now, mind you, I was seven. I was seven, yeah. maybe I was seven, six years old at the time. Uh, but I remember that. I remember, you know, Hubert Humphrey campaign signs. Okay, but I've watched presidential elections for a long, or presidential campaigns for a long time. Hers is the most incompetent I have ever seen. Stunningly bad, and much of it for a reason that that actually cycles back to some of the other things we're saying. All the way through the fall, her people in field offices on the ground were desperately trying to get the attention of the head office and of, of Hillary mm. herself to say, look, things are going really badly. We're not getting the money we need. We're not getting the support. We're losing people. Um, you know, the, the poll numbers here are horrible. And the headquarters was coming back saying, our computer models disprove your anecdote. <laughs> that was their line. Our yeah. computer, you know, our, our numbers disprove. Well, guess what? The voters disprove their numbers. Yeah, I think the, I think the, one thing that clearly illustrated how she did not get it um, mm -hmm. was, you know, the people that she tried to drag out to show that Trump was a bad guy or whatever she was trying to prove. <laughs> the, uh -huh. Now, she could have done that, but she picked the wrong people. You know, uh -huh. she picked, you know, a beauty queen who he had insulted. And, OK, you're going to get less sympathy for someone who's walking around trying to make it on their vanity than you are for, let's say, the many business people he, he left holding mm -hmm. the bag when he declared mm -hmm. bankruptcy. And when they, he did bankruptcy, yeah. You mm -hmm. know, yeah. And that, mm -hmm. if he would have had, if she would have had a few of those people up there or, you know, if that would have been the, the message of her campaign or, but, mm -hmm. you know, or if she would have, you know, if she would have been coming from that place and gone with something like that, Maybe she would have had a chance, but even then, I don't know. It's it's no. It's, it's, but the thing is, she she let Donald Trump make the campaign be about Donald Trump. Yeah. And as an experienced reality TV star, he was perfectly able to turn that to his advantage. She had to make the campaign about something other than Trump, and she had to do it by offering people something that would actually um, matter to them, and she never did. Yeah. I mean, Hillary Clinton's campaign from beginning to end was about I want to be president. Yeah. And. She, I don't think it ever sunk in that she actually had to give the voters a reason to vote for her. And that was one of the, one of the many dimensions of her failure. But yeah, watching, watching Trump um, go, just ignore the media and do this, this barnstorming tours, attracting immense crowds. And he, was, he figured out fairly early what he was tapping into. Again, the, it, is, it is the classic piece of slack jaw stupidity on the part of the privileged left to assume that Donald Trump is a, is a stupid man. Yeah. He's not. He is extremely clever. And one of the ways in which he shows his cleverness most clearly is by making, him play, making them play into his hand over and over again. Anytime his administration is about to do something that, he, that they would likely make a lot of noise about, he does a tweet storm on some other subject. Everyone talks about the tweet storm. Nobody notices, nobody pays any attention to you know, the changes in federal regulations that his people have put through. He does it over and over again, and nobody catches on. They're so caught up in that. Oh my God! Did you hear what Donald Trump? You know what? What? What he yeah. said? Uh, and, you know. The, yeah, he's he's. It's it's amazing he, to me too because the yeah. same people who get caught in that are mm -hmm. the type of people who, maybe not all of them, but a lot of them are the same type of people who would turn their noses up at anyone who pays attention to you know Kim Kardashian or whatever and it's it's the same type of thing because, it's the same thing yeah, yeah no yeah. he's he Donald Trump that's Donald Trump is a Kim Kardashian of American politics yeah it's 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 and, amazing 
Because I don't because I don't pay attention to his tweets. Yeah, I don't pay attention to his tweets any more than I pay attention to Kim Kardashian. But I hear about them from all the people who do. You know, it's exactly. The thing is, the thing is, all these people who think they're part of the resistance, they are Donald Trump's fanboys, (laughs) and he leads or fangirls, and he leads them by the nose, and they don't see it. They don't see that he is man- he is using them, he is manipulating them, he is playing mumbledy peg with what's left of their brains, and laughing all the way to his re-election in 2020. Yeah. Uh, uh, so I, I know. I, so go ahead. So I, I guess I guess that brings me on to another question. You know, in uh-huh. in, in, in in times like these when we. You know what you were speaking about earlier, where we have a difficulty, um, difficulty communicating, difficulty, you mm-hmm. know, stuck stuck on abstract ideas. Um, mm-hmm. You know, we get we get this, we get these. Well, Trump is not a great public speaker, but we do get these. <laughs> we do get these. We do get demagogues. Some of them are just demagogues like Trump, and some are you know are are good public speakers, and and that is. That is an interesting problem because it seems that people are are looking for that. You know, it's it's that real oh, yeah. alpha, alpha. It's that real alpha chimp thing. That when mm-hmm. when things get hairy, people look to the you know the the guy who looks like he's in charge, a guy who looks like mm-hmm. he's strongest or can handle himself or whatever. And yeah. people seem to line up between behind that guy. Oh yeah, um, yeah. It's it's a it's a normal rea- It's a normal uh, social primate reaction in times of stress. <clears throat> Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, and the thing is, I'm trying to think of somebody in in American politics right now who I would describe as a good speaker, and I can't think of one. Hmm. <laughs> um, it, it is true that Donald, that Donald Trump is more, you know, rambling stream of consciousness than most, but I think one of the reasons he does that is because it's an alternative to this sort of glib, glossy, vacuous, scripted stuff that we were used to getting from so many politicians. Yeah, he he yeah, cuts it, through. He cuts through. He really does. He cuts. He cuts through. Yeah, yeah. and it's <laughs> it's it's such a scene. Yeah, it is. It is quite amazing. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Okay, so moving on, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, all right, so. I find this really interesting. Um, your upcoming book club mm-hmm. um, is going to be reading the Cosmic Doctrine. I actually just got my copy. I read. Okay, the, good. I read the first chapter. Only gave it once through. Um, the first chapter. I'm going to. I'm going to. I'm going to. I'm going to continue to read it again before I uh, join in the book club because. And the the what don't 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 worry about that too much. What I'm going to be doing in in each each month's book club is talking through each chapter starting with chapter one so okay. the so um wednesday's wednesday's post is going to sort of talk through chapter one it's going to talk also about how to read a piece of fairly dense mm-hmm. occult philosophy and more generally how to tackle something that is not light reading yeah so um so you know by all means give it another look but what i'm i mean the first chapter the now um which edition do you have i have the the uh, Aquarian edition. You have the Aquarian. Okay, so yeah, so the excellent. So the first chapter. Um, that's the revised. That's the revised one, that's, right? That's, that's the revised okay. one. Yeah, I'm I'm talking to a publisher right now about about getting that back into print, mm-hmm. um, as I think it's a, frankly a better edition than the the unrevised one that Wiser has out now. But you know they'll both do. But so you know the first chapter is like three pages. Yeah. <laughs> it's not. It's not. But in that three pages, it covers an enormous amount of material, and teaching people how to unpack something like that is an important part of what I want to do with the book club. Mm. Yes. Yes. Well, uh, you know, especially. I mean, most people don't have any experience reading anything like that, um, mm-hmm. and and it's it's the type of thing that you either have to learn from somebody or you have to just sit down with a book like that and keep reading it mm-hmm. until it comes to you. And I've mm-hmm. kind of, mm-hmm. I've done the latter at points. Um, mm-hmm. um, oh yeah. You know, that that's, yeah. So, um, so is there any particular reason why this book, why now and far in, in terms of how it connects with your larger project of, of mm-hmm. rhetoric and education well, or mm-hmm. is it, well, it's part. It's partly that. Um, partly, be it, it is. I mean, 
as works of philosophy go, it's fairly short mm-hmm. and fairly comprehensive. If I, I'm right now in in my copious free time, I've been hacking my way through um, Jean-Paul Sartre's book *Being and Nothingness*, which is 812 <sighs> pages long, yeah, yeah. of extremely dense. Um, and he, he this this was early. This he wrote this in the early 1940s, um, when he had not long before been studying with Heidegger and Husserl, both of whom wrote a language that um, is very very opaque. Yeah, I, even for German, yeah, it's opaque. I, yeah, I yeah. It, Heidegger is one of those philosophers that when I've when I've read philosophy, I. Yeah, definitely very opaque. I would almost say bordering on like a, I don't want to say like a closed, like creates a closed system, but it's very mm-hmm. hard to penetrate. And I, mm-hmm. I, I have a problem with, with reading things like that sometimes because I feel like mm-hmm. if I can't get in there and mm-hmm. like if I can't get into a work and be able to really talk with anybody who hasn't read it about it, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. it's it's. I feel like it's too self-referential to not not to, not yeah. not, it's not useful, but it it it, it kind of reflects upon himself. My my friend, who's oh, yeah. A, yeah, my friend who's a, a philosophy PhD is you know studies Heidegger a lot, and he says no, it's like a geode. You get in there, and you're you know, it's it's this beautiful thing. I'm like yeah, but to everyone mm. else, it looks like a rock. Like, <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing. The th- there are two there are two factors here that that I keep in mind. The first is that in my experience, if someone cannot write clearly, it's usually because they they aren't thinking clearly. Yes. And so when you get a work of philosophy that's really really opaque, and you have to spend hours and hours trying to figure out whether it makes sense, um, it may not. And there's also, I mean, Heidegger himself has been quoted. I, I don't, I can't uh, vouch for this, but he's been quoted as saying that clarity is the enemy of philosophy. Uh-huh. And it seems to me that's only true if you're, if philo- by philosophy you mean having a career as a philosopher. Yes. Yes. Um, Hegel, who is who is not, I am not a fan. I am not a fan of Hegel at all. I have noted that literally every set of really bad ideas in European politics in the 20th century had, was rooted directly in Hegel. Hmm. Really, I mean, just, just all the, um, the, 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 the Italian fascists drew in, from Hegel via, via Giovanni Gentile. Hmm. Of course, um, the communists who killed a lot more than the fascists ever did um, got their idea via Hegel through Marx. Francis Fukuyama. You know the the uh, proclaimer of, of the end of history, oh. <laughs> one of the great works of unintentional comedy. Oh my goodness! Time. And it was based on Hegel. I'm trying. By Alexander Coiré. Yeah, yeah. No, it was, yeah, yeah. Exactly. He, it's all it's all Hegelian. And from this, one of the things I draw is that when Hegel says something, you know it's nonsense. <laughs> And anybody who says, you know, I've proved by Hegel's logic that this is going to happen, you know, it's not going to happen. Just, just that that's, it's one of those things. You can assume as a matter of course that if, it, if it's Hegelian, it's untrue. Now, I'm, I'm somewhat biased on this subject because I'm rather a fan of Arthur Schopenhauer, uh-huh. okay. who is far from popular these days. But Schopenhauer was of the opinion, Schopenhauer got a copy of um, uh, Hegel's The Phenology yeah. of Spirit, yes, and read it and said, this is a collection of words designed to imitate a philosophical document. <laughs> it does not actually mean anything. Hegel was just, you know, wanted to look really profound, and so he wrote something that would be so obscure that nobody, you know, people would spend all their time trying to figure out whether it had any meaning, and if so, what, rather than looking at it and said, this is garbage. Um, Arthur Sullivan Speaking one from our, one archer to another, um, and W.S. Gilbert have this great piece in um, their operetta Patience or Bunthorne's Bride, where the um, the character Bunthorne is singing. Um, you know, his his secret is to be so obscure that everyone thinks he's deep. You know, if this young man expresses himself in terms too, too deep for me, then what a very singularly deep young man this deep young man must be. Okay, that according to Schopenhauer was Hegel's entire stock and trade. <laughs> I think he was right. Well, I, I know this is this is horribly un, you know unpopular and unfair and all that kind of stuff, but I actually think the old grouch of Frankfurt was right. It's interesting. It's interesting. So you know, the first person I interviewed for for this for this podcast mm-hmm. is uh, mm-hmm. Douglas Lane. He's the um, 
he's he he runs the zero books uh mm-hmm. imprint it's a critical theory imprint hmm. um oh, sure. yeah <clears throat> yeah yeah oh dear <laughs> yeah yeah well and so they they've they've actually they've put out some good they've put out they've put out a mix of stuff um they they mm-hmm. did a book last year called kill all normies which is about internet <clears throat> subcultures um, mm-hmm. Which yeah. got at a lot of things that people are just starting to pick up on now, like mm-hmm. like the, mm-hmm. these different subcultures that are causing problems. Uh-huh. Um, gotcha. Yeah. So it's, it's it was inter- it was interesting talking to him, but but oh, yeah, yeah but yeah the the it's interesting because I mean I'm talking to a lot of people like that right now, and I'm coming rubbing you know running across a lot of people like that right now, mm-hmm. and there mm-hmm. definitely seems to be a bit of. <sighs> Like you can get, you can, it's great to, you know, get deep into things, but I definitely see places where I, someone starts talking and I, I go, I think this is, this is not leading anywhere, you know, like, <laughs> like, like, and look, I, you know, I have mixed feelings on Marxism, for example, mm-hmm. but if I have to listen to a Marxist talk about the labor theory of value, I, 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 I would rather like, you know, bash my head against the wall. I think it's one of those, <laughs> it's one of those, it's, it's probably why I've never act like, you know, what's why I've never read capital. I'm just like, no, I, I, I can't. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. It's, it's worth, it's actually worth reading the original. Yeah. It's actually worth reading, you know, volume one. Um, it's just, it's not that difficult to take in if you've tried to take if you if you tackled Heidegger, Marx's piece of cake, you, you know, <laughs> practically light reading. Um, but and also as a period piece, as a document of its time, and as, as a work of a very influential work of prose, it's I think I think it's worth reading. Um, Marxism as such um, is the most lethal ideology of modern times. You know, the the sheer body count. Of uh, of organized Marxism in the world is so high that I think I, I don't see any reason why anybody can justify it. It make I mean, the the you know Marxist regimes make make the fascists look like pikers. Yeah. Just in terms of uh, Stalin killed three times as many people as Hitler ever did, and then and Mao was so far beyond that. It, it you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He may, may he he made Stalin look like a, like a rank beginner, and then there's all the smaller. Marxist um, things. There are a lot of other bad societies or bad political theories in the world, but Marxism consistently turns out, um, you know, mass murderous dictatorships. Mm-hmm. So why anybody takes it seriously now, when the the evidence of history is very clear, is you know is not a testimony to the thinking capacities of our species. Yeah. But um, you know, I. It, it's, I don't know. Yeah, well, it's um, interesting. So, something I would like to do, and I, tell tell me mm-hmm. if you'd be interested in this. Um, I, I, you know, I I hear a lot of you know good podcasts with you know in, in, an interviewer with a with a guest. What I would mm-hmm. like to do is actually put together some podcasts where I have you know two two guests talking. Um, you hmm. know, have a, have have mo- have moderated discussions, or maybe even not you know not too moderated. But uh, it, w- it would depend very much. I w- it would depend very much on what kind of pairing you had in mind. For mm-hmm. example, I doubt the the social theory person or the the um, what's it the critical, uh, critical theory, theory. Person and I and I would have much to say to each other. Um, I don't um, know though. I don't know. It might be. It, I don't know. It, it might. My, it, my... it might be. It might be interesting. I I, I think <sighs> that. Well, mm-hmm. and and so he so there's somebody else associated with the imprint who I actually mm-hmm. think. Um, well, and the reason I, I suggest him is because he is somebody who is a Marxist, but who's very cognizant of the the failings of of Marxist mm-hmm. regimes, um, mm-hmm. and is very open to criticism and very, um, mm-hmm. uh, you know, very okay. open to criticism, okay. very open to engaging with other people. And then there's another mm-hmm. guy who works for the imprint, who actually was when he's my age, and he kind of came of age and. He was actually rather conservative for for a time, mm-hmm. um, and it travels in a lot of very broad circles. I think he's even mm-hmm. uh, traveled in some occult circles and things like that. Mm-hmm. So, th- I'm trying to. I-, I would like to see more types of conversations like that, where you get people who mm-hmm. don't see eye to eye on things, or well read, but also you know can sit, you can have a discussion and you know 
be cordial because that's that's very lacking these days. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. Well, we well, you yeah. know, I'm I'm will I'm willing to consider it. But yeah, yeah. If you know, if it if it goes pear shaped. Um, <laughs> He's also a science fiction writer, although his 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 recent book is on uh, augmented reality. Um, <laughs> yeah, but so I, I figured I'd, I figured I'd throw that out there because that is something I would like to see more of. There's there's mm-hmm. I, I feel like there's 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 not enough of that. There's there's mm-hmm. not enough of like those those the roundtable discussions or mm-hmm. or things mm-hmm. like that. I'd like to see more of those. Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah, something to something to think about. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so, um, yeah, you know, and so I mentioned, uh, I mentioned that book before Kill All Normies and how it, they mm-hmm. talked about incels and some of these other things that are going on mm-hmm. in, our, in our culture. And so mm-hmm. like, what do you, what do you make of all the, the, the alienation in this culture and, and how to address it? I mean, I know how I address it personally in my own life mm-hmm. and things like that. Mm-hmm. But 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 how do we look at it, you know, in the, in the broader society? And is there anything we can do about it aside from, you know, just mm-hmm. being good neighbors and whatnot? <laughs> OK, um, my take here is uh, on, on that is actually very strongly shaped by the writings of Gian Battista Vico, huh? who was one the first significant European writer who discussed historical cycles. Uh, Vico was active in the um, late 17th and early 18th century. In he was a, a professor of rhetoric at the University of Naples, and he his book, uh, usually called the New Science, it has the typical long ornate title back in those days, basically arguing for um, si- a cyclical theory of history, the idea that civilizations follow a, a recognizable life cycle, mm-hmm. and that you can track the different stages of them. One of the things that Vico was really really paid attention to is the way that Societies over time move from concrete to abstract, and this, and this is within a single society. In the earliest um, era of Roman law, this is something he studied being you know, a late Renaissance Italian, um, you have these extremely concrete laws. You know, if a man steals a loaf of bread, let him be given 12, 12 lashes yeah. with, a, with a hazel rod. We're guilt okay. and things like that. Yeah. But, but, it, but specifics. Not yeah. just a general concept, just saying, you know, it, like, yeah, the Saxon, but I'll get to that. But so you have this Roman, this, the early, very early in Roman law, the, laws of the, the law of the Twelve Tables. And then over the course of Roman history, the law gets, becomes more developed, it becomes richer, it becomes more abstract, it becomes more general. By the time you reach the, the high empire, the law is this immense carefully reasoned structure where all every possible <clears throat> act, you know legal action <clears throat> has some kind of meaningful place in this galaxy of abstract thinking it moves more and more abstract and the whole thing falls to bits and we have the early medieval law codes if a man steals a loaf of bread let him be given 12 you know 12 lashes with a with an hazel rod um, and so there's this this cycle all through we go from mythology to philosophy. We go from um, just to, uh, from a concrete politics of personal loyalty, of feudalism, this kind of stuff, to abstract patriotism and, and constitutional law and all this kind of stuff. There's this flow from the, con- from the extremely concrete to the extremely abstract over the life cycle of a society. And... This is not, I mean, we can call this progress, but only in a very ironic sense, because it doesn't necessarily go from the better to the, or from the worse to the better. Mm-hmm. It's not necessarily a matter of improvement. What typically happens is you start out in what Vico calls the barbarism of sense, a sensation, okay, where all you've got are crude sensory experiences. All you've got, there, there's no intellectual structure at all. Dark age societies, okay where it's just it's just grubbing in the mud. And then you cycle through this entire thing and you end up in the barbarism of reflection, where people's minds and reasons and thoughts have gotten so detached from any reality that they're basically crazy. Hmm. Yeah. That, 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 you know, it's, it sounds familiar. It's all, it, it, it sounds extremely familiar. And the <clears throat> alienation that we see now, the isolation of little subgroups via the Internet or otherwise, 
where people are just totally disconnected from the realities of their lives and just fixated on whether you've got, you know, the, the incels spinning bizarre fantasies about why they can't get laid, you know, when it's mostly because they don't bathe often enough and <clears throat> or what have you, yeah. um, you know, or you have like the furry community where people are dressing up as cartoon animals to have sex or what have this, this is the classic barbers of reflection yeah. where people have just become so caught up in these in these towering jerry rigged structures of abstraction that the simple realities of their own existence are, are alien to them. And so there's that alienation. And, well, what typically happens in Vico's scheme is that then you have another dark age. Hmm. <laughs> and I would like to be able to say that I think he's wrong, but I don't. Yeah. Um, the, the, two, the two great 20th century students of... Um, historical cycles, um, Oswald Spengler and Arnold Toynbee, basically made the same case yeah. uh, in, different, in different ways and using different logic. But in each case, you can watch what happens, especially um, Toynbee really gets into what happens when the, the dominant class, the, the, the group, the elite group that actually runs things, you know, the, the upper, say, 10 percent um, of the population by wealth and influence. Stop actually solving problems because they've gotten so detached from from the realities of daily life. They could just retreat inside, you know, into their little gated compounds. Yeah. Okay. And everything falls apart because they are no longer solving. They, they exist to solve problems, and they've lost the capacity to do so. They go through the motions. They they are they are engaged in representation and problem solving. Um, if this reminds you of the last three or four presidential <laughs> yeah. um, administrations, it should. Yeah. Um, and that typically ends, again, in the decline and fall of the fill-in-the-blank empire, and we have a dark age. And that clears away the crap, and event, and you go back to the barbarism of sense, and then people pick it up again and start moving, you know, let, let well, he, you know, if a man steals a loaf of bread, yeah. let him be beaten oh, but that's, 12 times. Oh, that's but that's all just historicism. That's just... <laughs> And the alternative is what? Yeah, well, that, and that's the thing. The alternative is is progress off into infinity, and the, the and progress is a religion. Yeah. So it's either historicism or it's utopian apocalyptic theology. Take your pick. Yeah. I know which one tends to give accurate predictions. And this is the thing: it's not as though the 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 historicism, it's not as though the the, the cyclical model of history has, is not being tested right now. By most measures, the standard of living in the United States has been falling steadily for the, the, you know, for the majority of its population since the 1970s. We are in obvious, blatant decline, and only those people who can withdraw behind, behind their gated compounds and, you know, and hide from the realities can keep themselves in ignorance of that. I mean, just the, the, the measure that I like to bring up is the fact when I was a kid, a an, an American an American family of four with one working class income could own their own house. Yeah. Could own their own car. Could pay all their bills. Had all every you know had four three square meals a day. All that stuff and a little left over for the occasional vacation or luxury. Nowadays, an American family of four with one working class income is on the street. Yeah. That's an immense change. Nobody wants to talk about it, but it's an immense change. It is the most important political fact of our time, and it shows how far we have declined. And it's and it's creeping up. That's the th that's mm -hmm. the other interesting thing. So I had a friend. She worked mm -hmm. for Merrill Lynch up until you know they no longer existed, and yeah. you know she. She started working there a few years after college, but the, the the people who are working there right out of college, these kids, they thought they thought they'd landed this this great job. They thought they were like, you know, they thought they were it, man. They thought they were, they thought and, they were set for life. Yeah, yeah, and so, but she's a smart, very smart person. She crunched the numbers. She realized that in real dollars, she was making less than somebody working on an assembly line in Detroit. In you know early 70s late 60s you know wow. even with yeah. all the benefits and the little perks mm -hmm. they gave her you know that it she was, was less than it was less than a car than a uaw car um yeah car factory guy yeah exactly okay smart person yeah did she land did she land on her feet when Marilyn? Lynch went oh on? yeah she landed on her feet she's uh okay, like psychologist she's a psychologist now she's doing <laughs> more more honest work okay <laughs> 
There you go. But yeah, excellent. But yeah, exactly. The thing is, it is creeping up into the middle class. And I think one of the reasons why, to cycle back to an earlier topic, the hysterical response to Trump is that a lot of people in the middle class are starting to feel them, you know, the, the, the gap between themselves and the increase of the impoverished, immiserated working classes, that gap is going away. And they've been turning with more and more, more and more of a frantic quality to a series of political messiahs who were going to save them all. You know, that's what Barack Obama was. That's, oh that's what that's what uh, Bill Clinton was back in the day. I remember when when he was running and the degree of of messianic frenzy that surrounded his campaign on the part of people in the middle classes were starting to feel the the gap opening beneath, beneath their feet. But at this point, a huge number of people who would normally expect a middle class income and middle class perks and all the other benefits of it are starting to face the fact that that's falling away under their feet. They're frantic instead of actually recognizing the situation and coming to terms with it again they threw their they they put all their faith on on a political messiah and what happened instead is that the um candidate of the hated poor the candidate of the working class of you know all those horrible um beer bellied um t-shirt wearing nascar watching fill in the blank you know those guys yeah the deplorables the deplorables he became president and so the gap that separates them from the people from the people one notch down the so the the totem pole the gap that is essential to their self image is dissolving around them and of course they're freaking out yeah. and because we're deeply involved in the barbarism of reflection as vico called it they're not doing it in a straightforward way they're not actually coming to terms with their situation they're it you're getting these bizarre these the, the sort of bizarre outbreaks of collective craziness. Yeah. I mean, do you, I, re, I remember when it was Russians who were trying to find, or try, they won, try that, I'm getting that backwards. Yeah. It was Republicans who were, try, who were trying to find Russians under every, uh, you know, under every mattress. All yeah. of a sudden the Democrats are doing it's, it. It's amazing. I, it's I, weird. Yeah, it's, it's very, it's very, very strange. Um, I, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, it's it's definitely very odd. Definitely like mm-hmm. the Russia hysteria is an is just another one of those things that I mm-hmm. like. Yeah, look, you know what? I, I have no doubt that they tried to rig the election, and I have no doubt that Trump has some sort of shady business dealings with them. But mm-hmm. again, where do you think that's gonna lead? Where do you know, like, what what kind of grand conspiracy do you think is really going on? And mm-hmm. don't you think it's maybe just you know one hand washes the other, and a guy who has shady business dealings, business dealings with like everybody? <laughs> <laughs> There's that. Yeah, I mean, you could probably make a very strong case that um, on the same basis that like Papua New Guinea influenced the election. I'm sure they had lobbyists involved. Everybody <laughs> does. And I'm sure Donald Trump has shady business dealings with Papua, with a firm in Papua New Guinea. Okay, um, he, but but why the Russians of all people? Yeah, I. You know what? Why generally? Why I'm, has why I'm, has the entire American establishment fallen through this time warp well, into Joseph McCartney? Well, and that's really, yeah. and that's Carthy. really, that's yeah, that's really the thing too. I mean, I, look, I, I'm old enough to remember part of the cold war you know i got mm-hmm. i caught the tail end of it and yeah. mm-hmm. and i you know like i was young i was you know i was a kid then but i remember mm-hmm. people legitimately being afraid of the bombs dropping and mm-hmm. and yeah. just saying like do we really want to do this again do we really want to get go toe to toe with another nuclear superpower is this really what we want to do do we really want to inc- like i i yeah it's just it's you, you know th- thank you i think the penny has just dropped Think of the number of Hollywood movies these days that are the rehashes of Baby Boomer, of the <laughs> comic books that Baby Boomers watched and read in their childhoods. Think of the number of social of all the shows that are just rehashes of Baby Boomer shows. Yeah. They're trying to relive their childhood, and their childhood was dominated by the Cold War. So they want a Cold War back again so they can relive their childhood one more time. 
Oh, those boomers, those boomers. Oh, goodness. Oh. It's just, it, it just, that, that just, that just struck me. It, that actually explains it. They're, fr- they want, they want to reclaim their, their lapsed childhood. I bet they start to wearing coonskin caps and wearing <laughs> boots again. Oh boy! Oh boy! Yeah, I mean, it just, it's, it, it is eerie. Um, gen- generally, the the boomers are a, are quite a phenomenon, and uh, their upcoming departure, I, I have to say, they won't be missed. But their upcoming departure promises to be very interesting. I've been, I've suspected for a long time that what we're going to see is um, a, ma- a a big, one last big boomer fad of suicide parties where they get together and play the music they listened to in high school and talk about all the all the good times of this kind of stuff, and then down vodka and sleeping pills. It could happen. Okay. I, I think I think it could happen. They, they think, had enough. You know, one last ideas. Yeah. One last mediagenic fad for the mass me the the mass media generation to beat all mass media generations. Well, they'll 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 certainly and you know what that'll be interesting because they'll probably be the last generation to really uh, retire in in the sense that yeah. Uh, you know. no, that, no, that's true enough. I mean, I, I'm right at the tail end of the boom. I was born in 62, and I do not expect ever to retire. Now, partly that's because I, I love to write, yeah. and so I expect to stop writing when they pull the keyboard out from under my cold, stiff fingers. But I'm never going to have the opportunity, and that's true of almost everyone else my age and younger. Um, you know, That's not going to happen for us. Social Security is going to be, if it's even there at all when the boomers get through, then I don't expect it to be. It's not going to be worth much. And, you know, one of those things. Mm. Okay, so I guess the last thing I wanted to talk to you about. So, you know, po- political labels are just notoriously mm-hmm. slippery, and you've, you've written mm-hmm. quite a bit about this. Um, <laughs> and I think it's interesting because, you know, right now there's a lot of people who are just like your standard conservative and mm-hmm. or your standard right winger and they call themselves classical liberals. Um, and mm-hmm. I, I find this interesting and, you know, because you, you, you identify as like a Burkean conservative, right? I, I am a, mo- I am a moderate Burkean conservative. Yeah. That's correct. Well, it's which inter- puts me at odds, which put, puts me at odds with almost everybody on the, uh, across all yeah, of the political yeah. spectrum. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because, because you know the the people who go around calling themselves classic liberals, they basically have the same you know policy positions on things as anyone on the right. But what I think is interesting about you is because the Burkean conservatism is very much a lens by which it seems it's as much a lens as which you evaluate things through. Um, a lot of the positions you come down are things I hear from. Well, people, some of them are people who call themselves Marxists, um, mm-hmm. but, you know, like postal banking, bank reform, mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. Uh, uh, worker-owned co-ops, um, mm-hmm. things like mm-hmm. this. I find that really, I find that really interesting, actually. And I, that's actually why I would like to, you know, try and facilitate mm-hmm. some talks with you, because I think gotcha. you, you have a lot of, you have a lot of, um the ability to zero in on things that mm-hmm. they are having a trouble zeroing in on things. And gotcha. there's this, there's this mantra going around right now uh, because of this, this, this huckster Jordan Peterson, clean your room, you know, um, you know, th- mm-hmm. th- that's like th- something. And I think that very much a lot of the people who are trying to create reform and things, they, they don't have their house in order. Um, the thing I always think is like, you know, uh, all the people in college I knew who were Marxist or whatever, they were the last people you'd want to be roommates with, let alone live in any type of commune. With. Um, yes. Oh, and, yes. And so, I knew the type. Yeah. And so, and so it's interesting because, and that, that, that's actually why, why I think I would like to to get you to talk to you know to okay. find people like that you could talk to. Um, well, the, the the thing the thing with regard to Berkey and conservatism is that it's founded on a principle that almost everybody finds incredibly frustrating, and that's asking the question, well, what happened when we tried that the last time? Yeah. And it so happens that there were the things that you named. Okay, postal banking. It's extremely effective. It, it, wherever, it's, wherever it's been done, as long as it hasn't been you know, treated as a slush fund by the political system, it works really well. Japan does it now. 
Mm. It's a huge, and it makes their bank it, one of the things that makes the Japanese economy so stable is they have this huge amount of, of you know, um, investments in the in the through the postal banking system that just kind of sets their earning interest. We could do that. It, it would take the stroke of a pen. Yeah. And you know, and some hiring. What a concept to set up a postal bank, banking system, and that would force the um, commercial banks to actually have to compete yeah. for you know for and, and not just not just go okay how can we how can we rip off rip off people this time so you have postal banking in the same way worker co ops we know how they work they work extremely well I have I've shopped at any number of worker owned businesses it's a good system so instead of trying to come up with a grand scheme to fix everything which of course has never been tested or in the case of marxism has been tested and it's produced ghastly human rights consequences wherever it's been put to put into practice um let's let's look at fixes let's say okay what has worked in the past what hasn't worked in the past what conclusions can we draw what is the simplest and least invasive change we can make to a system um, in order to keep as much of it working as possible, at least as well as it does. People say, well, the system is horrible and it doesn't work and it's broken. Well, yeah, but typically the systems they want to replace them with work even worse. Yeah. So you know, we have a system that more or less functions kind of sort of you know, on, on good days. So the thing to do is look how to tune that up to make it work better and not try to bring in some kind of intellectual wet dream um, that almost certainly won't work. That will bring, could bring the whole thing crashing to the ground. So that's, I mean, that's kind of the Burkean conservative attitude. What happened the last time you tried that? And of course, it's also based on the fi- that fine old principle that insisting that you can do the same thing and get different results is a good definition of insanity. Yeah, yeah. Again, another reason why Mar- why Marxism as such deserves to be, you know, it, it you know, cap- capital is worth reading, but it frankly, for as a political system, it belongs in the same rack as Mein Kampf. <laughs> Because it kills people, it, it, you know, it causes it, it. When it's applied, it brings about mass murder, yeah. um, and that's what happened the last time we tried it, and over and over again. So let's not go there again. Um, but the thing is, we need to start thinking in these terms because the. I, I think a lot of people have not grappled with the fact that the survival of our society is at risk. Yes, and if our society falls apart, millions upon millions upon millions of people are going to die, whether that's in civil war, in famine, in um, political repression, in prison camps. There's all kinds of ways that could happen. When yeah. a society falls apart, utopia does not dawn. Typically, what happens is the body count goes goes up in the umpty you know, umpty ump digits. So let's not go there. Yeah. Let us realize that our civilization is fragile. It is vulnerable. It if we if we don't happen to want millions and millions and millions of people to die horribly, maybe we need to act as though it's a fragile, vulnerable thing. We all need to work together to save it. Yeah, and that's that's I think the thing I wanna I, I kind of wanna end on is just talking a little bit about just the decline. Um, the the, mm-hmm. the fra- the way I always like to put it. Um, is Rome did not fall in a day, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. And I don't. This is this is the topic that, for lots of reasons, it just does not get as much attention. You know, climate change gets a lot of attention, rightfully mm-hmm. so. Um, mm-hmm. But but you know, n- you seldom hear anybody talk about uh, peak oil. Maybe isn't even the best term anymore. Uh, resource mm-hmm. depletion or mm-hmm. or whatever. It is it is so difficult to. E- even begin to talk about it because mm-hmm. people don't even half the people you you mentioned it to don't even know what you're talking about exactly uh, which is which is baffling to me because it's literally th- probably the one thing that is driving economics and politics yeah, exactly. so, mu- but, so, so much um mm-hmm. but the the, me- the our, our mass media and our collective met our collective thoughts our collective conversation about the future is so focused on star trek <laughs> it's so focused on these dreams of perpetual progress and so many people think that you know that that that's the way things happen now partly that's because we have such a miserably we do such a miserably bad job in america of teaching people a history i mean our, our, our public schools are the worst in the developed world many third world countries have better education systems than we do today 
and that doesn't help. <laughs> but we have this, the most the most flat, caricatured, empty notion of history, all structured along this this you know religious belief in, in perpetual progress, and people can't see past that. So um, the, I have found a certain amount of traction these days um, can be gotten by pointing to decline as people are actually experiencing their lives, reminding them of the day not that long ago when you know working class people actually could could um, find have a place to live, and pointing out you know the, the, the decay of infrastructure and so on. And there's usually a lot of pushback, but I can sometimes get people to realize you know look outside your window. This is what Rome looked like when it was falling. And it's just one of those things. We, frankly, the peak oil movement shot itself through both cheeks, and I don't mean the ones in their faces. Um, <laughs> when, when, the number of people in the peak oil thing who jumped on the, the you know, one apocalyptic bandwagon after another, mm-hmm. insisting, you know, oh, it's all going to collapse and come crashing down in, in six weeks. And of course it didn't. And they blew the credibility out of the water. And the, the minority of us who all along were saying, no, don't be a moron. That's not the way these things happen. There, we're going to have, well, we're, you know, we're looking at something that's going to be stretching out over many decades of, of you know, cycling, cycling through tightening and loosening, spike, prices spike, prices crash. It's just, you know. Yeah. Complicated calculus look. of the way exactly. markets respond. Exactly. And yeah, it's, it's exactly. not. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. But no, people were all into the Hollywood catastrophe. And I got it. to this day. I have I mean, it was like I think last week I had somebody who was coming on saying, well, I, you know, I, I, I understand you're into this whole peak oil thing, but I, I just I don't believe I don't believe we're going to be having a sudden collapse. And I'm like, I've never said we were. <laughs> we're talking about decline. And I walked him through that. And of course, he never responded. That's that's they usually they, that's usually that's how you know you flee. got them. That's how you know you got exactly. them. Exactly. But the thing is, no. The thing is, that's usually, in my experience, it's when they respond and actually actually deal with it and talk to you that you've actually made some progress. What happens is they simply crash. You know, the 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 buffer crash. So you get the metal equivalent of a blue screen of death. Yeah. Um, because they they don't they are not willing to think that thought. That is an unapproved thought. Okay. It is not a thought that exists in pop culture right now. It is not approved. You are not supposed to think that. So you empty your mind and go stare at a television for a while until you feel better. Uh, and it's it's really embarrassing because decline is the is the, the, the predominant fact of our time. It's something that's been going on most of my life. And those of you who were born after about 1972 have in in America, you've never known anything else. And yet people won't see it. It's not an elephant in the room. It's a brontosaur in the room. <laughs> okay, maybe a herd of brontosaurus in them, and nobody wants to deal with it. I honestly think a lot of people realize that that's the situation we're in. They're aware of the decline, and the re- and that's why they won't talk about it. They're too busy pretending that it doesn't exist. Yeah, I, I think on a, at least a subconscious level, it that that's going on. I really do. I think mm-hmm. on at least on a subconscious level that mm-hmm. people, people they know. They they, know. they they know on some uh, some level that's I mean that explains mm-hmm. the 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 rage and the tensing up and the denial when you mm-hmm. whenever you bring it up. Yeah, it may also it may also um, explain the part another part of the reaction to Trump's election because the you know all of the utopian fantasies piled on Hillary Clinton of all people. Um, it was going to be the next great step forward in progress, the next thing we can use to deny the reality of our decline, and instead. You know, um, we got Donald Trump, reality TV star. Hard not to see that as a step downward, especially if you're if you're a liberal persuasion. And yet, you know, and so yeah, they freaked out because they they actually had to face the possibility that utopia is not on its way. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All righty. Well, I think on that note. Okay, excellent. Thank you for a lovely conversation. Yes, um, it was excellent I, talking to you. As I mentioned, I enjoy podcasts. Yeah, yeah, no, it <laughs> it, it was it was fun. It was fun. I'm glad we got to do this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you know, let's. I, I'm I'm willing to consider talking to you know to your to your uh, Marxist friend, and seeing if we can find have a conversation that does not end up with, you know, him yelling at me as a you know running dog. Of no, his, well. Um, as a well, one of the interesting things as him being a guy who has 
publish things that are very critical of leftist call out culture. He mm-hmm. has he has taken a lot of criticism from those type of people, hmm. and he is okay. Thank he, you. That that actually makes me feel a lot better. No, no, he, he is. He, yeah, a lot, well, too many people who are into who are into um, critical theory are in that in the call out culture up their eyeballs. Uh, no, as a matter of fact, um, he. He he's incredibly critical of it. The, that book, Kill All Normies, was got a lot of mm-hmm. flack from that um, from that end mm-hmm. of the, that spectrum. And he's mm-hmm. actually done. He does. He's a podcaster as well. And he's done podcasts where he's had people who would have leveled that type of criticism at him. And he's actually talked with them and remained civil the whole time. And he actually while I, they were screaming at him, while yeah. they were screaming at him, and he he okay. remained incredible incredibly cool um and i believe one of those was called uh you know he i was gonna say humorously but maybe not so humorously he entitled that episode of the of that podcast uh a struggle session <laughs> so uh, you know he's he's a he's a he's a he's a cool character um mm-hmm. in, in, okay. in that regard okay. so it might be it might be interesting i have no idea if he's interested i haven't asked him yet. and you can you can let him know and um I can let's see. I can probably um, since he since he is a you know he is a podcast published author this kind of stuff. I may be able to get one of my pub, my peak oil publisher to send him a book so he knows um, what kind of craziness I'm talking about. Yeah, he might even be aware of you. I think I mentioned him. Good heavens. Uh, um, yeah, he, <laughs> I mean he might even be aware of you. He lives in uh, Pacific Northwest, so I don't know. I have mm-hmm. a feeling. Uh, Got that. You're, you're, but yeah. Well, the thing no, the thing is. I you know I have I have my 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 fan, my fan community, but I am way out there on the fringe. Yeah, and uh, most most even even people in relatively on the edge outfits like uh, critical the critical theory scene and so on have generally never heard of me. Yeah. It's one of those things. I'm, I'm not too. Worried oh, and about he it, um but... he he. Oh, it's a while back now, but he interviewed uh, Dmitry Orlov a while back. Oh, okay, yeah. yeah no, so... but he may actually know because. Dimitri and I, um, of course, go back a long ways. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, indeed, indeed. Uh, one of the the one of the little surprises was the the uh, the panel you guys did last year. That was incredibly, oh, that, incredibly. That was great. a hoot. That yeah. was a lot of fun. Yeah. Okay. All righty. Excellent. Excellent. All right. Well, thank okay. you very much. Have a good night. You're very welcome. Yeah. You too. Now. Bye. Bye.